My name is Richard T. Scott. I'm a classical painter gone rogue. Now, I'm leaving the studio to search for artists who color outside the lines. I'll be your guide on this odyssey to answer the eternal question, what is art? They say that every work of art is a self-portrait of the artist. Richard Sage's intricately embroidered figures on twall of aliens, misfits, and monsters raucously invading the bucolic tableau, it's a unique illustration of that idea. His work is full of contradictions. It feels both aesthetically elevated, but self-conscious. Simultaneously, a sincere appreciation of the Rococo joy of the pattern and a not-so-thinly-veiled critique of the same bourgeois sensibility it celebrates. For some, art is about tradition. For others, art is about craft. For Richard Seja, art is about subversion. His mastery of color, texture, and pattern, well, that would be plenty enough for many artists, but he achieves deeper levels of meaning seemingly without effort. The more you sit with this work, the more you marvel in both its visual and conceptual charm. Richard, thank you so much for having me over sure. to your place to talk with you about your work. Mm -hmm. I've been a fan of your work since well before I met you. Oh, really? And was surprised to find that you lived in the same town. Yeah, that so was wild. I'm very pleased to be your neighbor. You literally live around the corner yeah. from me. <laughs> yes, here in the bucolic village of Catskill. Your work, it's both um, simple but but incredibly sophisticated at the same time. Thank you, yes. It's, it's like this incredible distillation of the concept uh, in, into a very approachable kind of visual medium. Yes, the weird thing is like the inspiration just never stops for me. It's like not an issue. Uh, part of what I like about my work uh, from a personal viewpoint is that I have no problem embroidering the same vignette in the toile again and again and again, like, and doing it, like, you know, 10, 20 times, because every single time it's completely different than the time before, and it doesn't get old for me. Well, Richard, this has gotten me really excited to show your work to everybody, so why don't we go inside and, and, and check it out? Sounds good. All right. I grew up at the Jersey Shore in Point Pleasant, a tiny little town. Not mm, very interesting for me. I was really hungry for culture and there was very little of that there. So I spent a lot of time in high school going up to New York City, seeing a lot of art. I had two aunts who never married and they sort of commandeered my cultural education. Anything I wanted to do, they would take me to do, whether it was going to Marvel Comics with my portfolio of characters or to see a Joseph Boys retrospective at the Guggenheim. It was amazing. So after that, I uh, decided I was interested in surface design, and so I moved to Philadelphia and I enrolled in a class at the University of the Arts Two things happened. I realized that I needed a real education and that I wasn't going to get that at art school. And I also realized that I loved working with my hands and I was making ceramic vessels at the Flesher Art Memorial. It's an amazing place. It still exists, very beautiful. So I moved to Santa Fe thinking that that would be a great place to do ceramics. I was working at 
a studio that was attached to St. John's College, and a friend of mine was enrolled there, and he suggested that I sit in on some of his classes, and I did, and I was just immediately blown away and impressed by that approach to education. All of the classes are seminar classes, taught around a table, discussion classes, no professors. It's basically just, you know, you start with the Greeks, you move your way through Western civilization to the moderns, and you just talk. You oh, read so and talk. It was fascinating. So I applied, but they didn't want to let me in because my math scores were abysmal in high school. And that's just because I wasn't interested. I, hey, I get it. And then the irony is my junior year in college, calculus was by far my favorite class of all four years. Well, it becomes more theoretical and more like abstract. And, and you see the beauty. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I could see like the undeniable beauty of math like just come to life for me. So I did that. I graduated, and when you graduate from St. John's, you're very educated, but you're not very employable. So I took a couple of years off to wait tables and teach myself Photoshop and Illustrator. And I wound up getting a job at a little ad agency in New York City, a division of Dentsu, which is one of the largest ad agencies on the planet. And I did that for a while and I was laid off and decided to start working with my hands again. And like all three of those things sort of coalesced, the art school, the classical education, and advertising, and it all coalesced to do essentially what I do today. By anyone's standards, you, you would be considered a successful artist. I mean, your work is fantastic. You've got a great livelihood from it. Personally, how do you define success? I feel like I do something in this world that no one else does. And I kind of just stumbled upon it. I haven't worked very hard trying to make that happen. I work very hard doing the work itself, mm -hmm. but I'm not about marketing myself. I apply to things only when someone tells me that I should apply for them because they think I would get it. But it's just nice to sort of like walk the earth knowing that I do something that's very individual that no one else can do in the same way that I can. Success to me is peer recognition by other artists appreciating my work, talking about my work, and being included in shows with people whose work I respect. That's, yeah. That, to me, is what success is. Absolutely, having the recognition of people you admire and respect, right. it, it feels good. Yeah. And, you know, it makes you feel part of a community in a way. It does. I find the same thing with myself in that these kind of pieces of, of experience and education that you didn't necessarily think right. would would weave together, somehow do weave together. You know, like we're always looking for causes for things, but sometimes maybe things just happen and there's no real answer. When I first saw your work and you know, even today, I was and continue to be struck by the unique quality that it has. A lot of your work is populated by, you know, monsters and misfits and half-human hybrids. In my mind, there is, there's a short leap between that and analogies with the island of Dr. Moreau oh, and Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. In both of those books and films, these creatures were the product of, in many ways, mankind's hubris. Right. You know, I'm curious if you find that metaphorically relating to your own life experience or something about the era that we're living in. First of all, I'll say that a lot of my work is about um, acceptance and difference, and when that all stems from childhood and. As a child, I felt very different. And with both of those movies, you have these creatures that exist because of the normal people creating them, and it goes horribly awry. So I think like on some level, to try to make a monster accepted and to show the vulnerability of the other, in a way it's saying that 
I am not going to be affected by the other people around me who are trying to keep me down, who don't accept my differences. It's like, ultimately, it's the struggle for survival and acceptance just by being who you are rather than being who other people want you to be. You know, on the surface level, your work is beautiful and ornate. But when you start to look at it for more than just a minute, I'm actually feeling that kind of emotional resonance coming through. Uh huh. That is that ineffable something. Yeah. And yeah. so I have, like, even when I was a child, my oldest friend in the world, I would do these stupid little doodles. And she, she pointed out, like, in fourth grade, that even in a little doodle, I was able to imbue that little sketch with some sort of spirit. And yeah. I feel like that's... I mean, isn't that what artists do? Yeah, like it's you're, the je ne sais quoi. Yeah, it's exactly. The, the magical, yeah. intangible right. thing that we can't yeah. plan for. We can't. Right. We can't make. You can't force it. it. Yeah. It just yeah. It just happens, and it's like it's spirit. It's like yeah. imbuing your spirit into the inanimate object, and so I mean that really is like literally what the act of creation is. It's a privilege and a grace to be able to do that. You never have a lack of ideas. I wonder if there have ever been any moments where you were kind of stuck. I will say that there has never been a moment where I felt stuck. Part of that is the grace I was talking about. I just sit down and it just flows out. You know, I'll go back to pieces, put pieces away, come back to them, add embroidery to them if I feel that they need it. I'm not a suffering artist by any stretch of the imagination. You always want to take the path of least resistance when it comes to your work. Yeah. Just do it, let it flow. Absolutely. Do you ever feel any tension between making work that you feel is more marketable or work that's more deeply connected to what you want to do? A gallerist actually said this to me once. He said he feels like it's not necessarily a matter of time, that the piece will find its owner eventually. And I've sort of taken that as words to live by. And I don't try, I never go into a project thinking, oh, like, they're gonna love this, you know, that's not interesting. I'm not there, I'm not here to sell work. I'm here to make work. And if it sells, that's great. And if it doesn't sell, that's great too. I feel like every piece is just waiting for the person who wants it. And sometimes I'm surprised. One of the best things I've ever done just sold like last week. And it's been knocking around for five years. It just took a little while. And then something that I did, you know, last month sold like immediately as soon as it was put up on the wall. So it's hard to dictate. And also, that's not what I'm doing. Like yeah. I'm yeah. making the work, I'm not selling it. That's what, that's what the business guys are for. I have found the same thing that if you just make your work, yeah. it only really requires one person to connect with that piece. I have noticed that a couple of your newer pieces seem to be in dialogue with current events. And I'm curious how often or how much does that affect your work and what you choose to make? That's a good question. Um, I don't want to flatter myself thinking that the times that we're living in are any worse than any other time that either I've lived through or, you know, from centuries before. But sometimes it feels like external forces are bearing down on us and you know you there are four completely horrific things happening in the world at any given moment and sometimes i just like need to address it and i use the work as a way of kind of releasing the tension and the anxiety that may come from living in a pretty wretched place. And I find that it helps. Not only that, when other people see it on social media or in a gallery, there's a commonality there that we share. Like I've addressed something that they have been a part of also. And I try not to be excessively topical with the work. I'd never want to be super pedantic with it. I hate work that 
tells you how you should think about it. But that's me. It's yeah. a, that's a ma- that's a matter of taste. There are a couple places, arenas, where language just doesn't really. It doesn't. The written word doesn't have a part necessarily. What I'm drawing from this is the level of ambiguity in what your work is saying, and mm-hmm. text seems too didactic or it something. It is. And if I do have something very precise and didactic to say, I will embroider it in braille. Something oh, like cool. where where yeah. you have to actually do a lot of work to find out what's yeah. what's being depicted. Uh, one of the earliest pieces I did, it's called The City of Lost Angels, and it's a passage that I found so beautiful from uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, where uh, it's the one of the cast off angels talking about missing heaven. It's the passage is embroidered in tiny little French knots in braille. When you shut the lights off, it looks like a city seen from far away. Oh, so it incredible. works on a lot of different levels. Yeah. And so that's where I will indulge myself using text, but it, it has to be very conceptual. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's the difference between art and design, really, where design is, comes prepackaged for you. There's an expectation on the creator that should be accomplished by the viewer. Ambiguity is one of the great things about art, where you get to figure it out like, some, somehow yourself. And that's there's a beauty in that, to engage with something that someone else has made without being told what to think about it. Richard Sage's work isn't so much about the subversion of the natural order, but the subversion of an unnatural order, a kind of false nostalgia for the superficial mirage of a past that never was, a playland of hedonistic nobility dancing through lush gated gardens. Sage has channeled Carl Jung's insight One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. I think this is why his monsters seem much more alive, more real than the illustrations they inhabit. Jung also said that the most terrifying thing is to accept oneself completely. I suspect that's true for nearly every person on this planet. It certainly is for me. Perhaps the process of making art is our way of doing that, of uh, making the darkness conscious, of accepting ourselves, and through that realizing that we are not monsters at all, it is only the unnatural world we inhabit that makes us think so. (laughs) 